about it very heavily with that. Um, I also know Nick. Nick came and talked to me, kind of went down a little bit more of the rabbit hole with statistics uh, with Nick, and I think he went too. But that's okay. Machine learning is all about some statistics. Randall works in different kind of statistics. Um, and I know some of you have mentioned that you're interested in biotech or biomedical. Um, and so what he does is, pretty, is related to that. Um, so please pay attention to that part. Um, he's also going to tell us about some of the stuff that he does for fun. Because just because you're an adult and have a job doesn't mean you stop tinkering and making cool things and playing with them. It means you can afford the better toys. <laughs> afford the better toys. Um, so thank you for being here, Rainbow. Hello. So. Um, please interrupt me if you have any questions. This is, I intend this more as a conversation. Um, I have sort of a, a talk planned out, but if we go in an, another direction, as long as it's not getting into summations and things Nick already covered, that's perfectly fine. So I'm a clinical statistician. Um, I run clinical trials. So uh, who here knows what a clinical trial is? So what, what do you think a clinical trial is? Yes. Yes. So um, medicine and medical devices are probably the most um, heavily regulated um, industry in the world, including possibly even military technology. So what we have to go through to get a drug approved is um, a sequence of three different phases of clinical trial followed by the post-marketing phase where you continue to track the drug for the entire existence of the drug to make sure no new issues come up. So the first phase of a clinical trial is the phase one study, which is dose finding and safety. So the first study that you do in humans is not even to see whether the drug works, it's to see whether the drug is safe. So you slowly and carefully escalate the drug dose according to specific rules to see whether or not the drug is going to start um, any sort of negative side effects in people and hopefully catch them before they turn into serious negative side effects. From there, once you've done that, you go into the proof of concept or the phase two trial and this is a small pilot trial to make sure that your drug actually is efficacious. So typically to prove that a drug is truly efficacious, you may need um, anywhere from 150 for a very large effect size to multiple thousands of patients in your study to finally prove to the FDA that your drug is truly efficacious. The phase two is usually a much smaller study, and that's sort of the internal proof. Do we have enough evidence? Can we show that there's enough of an effect size that this probably would go through and prove final efficacy in your phase three? And then once you get to phase three, this is what people normally think about when they think about a clinical trial, is the phase three trial. Um, in the phase three trial, your goal is to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt um, for a very small p-value that it is extremely unlikely that your drug, the effects of your drug would be observed by random chance. So you want to prove that your drug is efficacious and then still from there you move into post-marketing where you continue to track efficacy but you also continue to track side effects. So, yes? This is also sort of the flow for biotech, right? Turning medical devices that Yes. Yes. So this is um, the, there's three different types of clinical trials. There's drug trials, there's medical device trials, and then there's diagnostics trials. And all three of those follow along the same sort of track. Yes? So what's the process of like actually creating the drug and finding out how it works and like side um, So the actual creation of the drug is done before that gets to me. So I still, I work in the phase one in early oncology with cancer pharmaceuticals. So depending on what the drug is, it may, usually there will be some sort of first in vitro model, or in vitro model, and then usually an in vivo model. Um, 
so the in vivo model is frequently done in mice or rats, and before it can be moved into humans, it will usually be tested in beagles or sino monkeys. So that is usually, um, those are very rarely sacrificial trials once they move into those animals. Those are usually the PK and toxicity trials. So what does the drug do? But um, the dis early discovery is scientists in a lab, um, they'll usually use cell lines and they'll come up with a theory, they'll put whatever their theory is into a cell line and see whether it starts killing the cell line and then they'll move into animal models and then they'll move into the toxicity studies to make sure that the drug is not poisonous and then they'll pass it off to us in the phase one trial. No. Any other questions? Oh yeah, um, the, and the medical devices also follow along the same track. Um, so my job as a statistician, really, I have to, if not understand, at least be aware of and work with everybody involved in this, the trial. So this includes, trials are usually very large. They involve multiple doctor's offices who are called the principal investigators. Those investigators will recruit patients into the trial because no single doctor can recruit um, the 300 patients in any sort of reasonable amount of time. So usually in my trials, we'll have anywhere between five to 10 investigators. Um, phase two and phase three could have multiple hundreds of doctors around the world um, who are recruiting patients into the trial. We also have to work closely with operations who um, help deal with these, um, all of the doctors. So they coordinate with the doctors. But as a statistician, I need to know how this data is being collected. Because my job, final job, is helping make a decision at the end and then take that decision to the FDA and get the FDA to approve my decision. So I work with operations because they're the ones who are in charge of collecting the data. I work with the biomarkers and the scientific group because they're the ones who help advise which data should be collected and what sort of metrics would be useful for looking at that data. I work with the doctors because they need to help with safety. They need to tell us whether some, some signs of side effects in the drug are dangerous to the patient or merely unpleasant. And for working with cancer pharmaceuticals, it can be very depressing because you do not want to know what a grade two diarrhea is like. It goes all the way up to grade five, which was fatal. Um, grade one is minor inconvenience. Grade two is serious inconvenience. Grade three is so inconvenient that you basically cannot function in daily life. Grade four is life-threatening, grade five is death. So those are the different grades of adverse events that a drug could cause, or in our case, that are usually caused alongside from the underlying disease and may have nothing to do with our drug. So we have to deal with the doctors to figure out what is the benefit of the drug worth the side effects that we may be causing with the drug. So once we figured out what we want to decide, we move back and we figure out what our analysis is. So what, like, what is the decision? Is it an efficacious decision? How efficacious are we looking at overall survival? Are we looking at a response rate? Are we looking at progression-free disease? Are we looking at complete eradication? Um, how are we going to analyze that? Are we going to sometimes, so in statistics, what you've learned in basic statistics, any entry-level statistics class that you've taken, that is what we would like to use. So if we can get away with doing these sorts of decisions based off of a t-test, that is what we would love to be able to use. Yes. Um, so this is a great, actually, 
segue or side rabbit hole. The tea test actually comes from making beer at Guinness Brewery. Um, so do you, um, a tea test is a way of testing, does the mean of this group of data differ from the mean of this group of data? And it's a distribution where you don't know what the standard deviation is. And it assumes some level of normality, which you can do uh, by the central limit theorem once you end up with a large enough sample size. Most distributions that are appropriately well behaved, the mean of them will head towards a normal distribution. So the t-test um, originally was discovered by Guinness Brewery. It's called the student t-test because his bosses would not allow him to publish under his name for commercial reasons. So Guinness did not want the other gr beer brewing companies to know that they were using statistics to brew their beer because then other companies would start doing it and they would lose the advantage it was giving them. But he had discovered a mathematical way of comparing different batches of beer and the alcohol content they were getting from some of the different processes that they were using. And he wanted to publish it. They said no. So he published the method under a pseudonym, student T. And that's where the t student's T test comes from. And then finally, once we have that analysis method figured out, then we move on out to design. So what, what is the sample size? What, it's very, sample size in clinical trials is very important because it's human lives that you're dealing with here. So it's not like we can just say, oh, we're going to take a gigantic sample size. Um, that would be completely unethical because we're then taking patients who could potentially benefit from some other therapy and we're giving them ours that we don't know whether or not it works. So in some cases, the design and clinical trials can get very strange because you need to always maintain patient safety. And you may not be able to do what you would like to do as a statistician. So any questions on that? All right. Um, so this is basically the questions I ask the, as a statistician and the, an example of the roles I would play. So these questions are questions that I would ask interacting with my team. And then I would take their answers and try and determine this on my own and come back to the team and see what works. And that team interaction is actually one of the reasons I enjoy being a statistician. So who, who has heard, stay in your lane? The, who can explain what that means? So I tell you, kind of sort of, because doctors started commenting, as a PR doctor started commenting on um, gunshots um, and how fatal they are. And the NRA, or the National Rifle Association, fired back telling doctors not to comment on guns and that they should stay in their lane. But so, and then what it's usually used to mean the what is your area of expertise? Stay in that. So as a statistician, I get to stick my nose into everybody else's business because they don't necessarily know what is or isn't going to affect the final outcome or potentially bias the results of an experiment. So an example of that is, who, who's seen oatmeal with the big heart on it that says, heart healthy breakfast lowers cholesterol? Yeah. So do you know where that study came from? So they took a bunch of Americans and they told them, half of them, you have to have oatmeal for breakfast. The other half, you can have whatever you want for breakfast. So is this a good experiment? No, why not? Well, no, they, 
they had significantly lower cholesterol, the group that was eating oatmeal. But, but why? Yeah, you're, yeah, close. So what are the other foods? What is your ideal breakfast? Yeah. So the, that's exactly the answer. So oatmeal wasn't healthy for your heart. What was healthy for your heart and lowering cholesterol was not having fried bacon and eggs for breakfast. And that has then spawned that entire advertising campaign for oatmeal was based off of um, what in statistics you'd call a confounding factor. So, yes. So it's everybody needs statisticians, but nobody likes us because we like sticking our noses in everybody else's business. Um, we, your job, if you become statisticians, would be to go in and try and understand at least enough of everything. You can never understand everything, but you get to keep learning. You get to keep playing. Um, I get to go into work and sit down with amazing PhDs in biomedical issue, um, both doctors, um, researchers, everybody, and I get to sit with them and they explain what they're doing and I can actually be helpful to them by taking what they're doing and helping them transfer it into a mathematical model and helping them design an experiment to do exactly what they want to do. And that's really a lot of the statistician's biggest pet peeve is when people come to them at this point instead of at this point. So as a statistician, I do not, I want to be, to use a doctor simile, I want to be a general practitioner. I don't want to be a ER doc. I don't want to come to your experiment after it's had a heart attack. I want to help your experiment by telling it to stop eating all of the bacon and eggs before it has the heart attack. And a lot of times people come to statisticians with my dad, hey, my dad, it's doing something funny. What can I do? How can I help it? And that's what I said earlier about we would like to use just a basic t-test. We would love, or question, or just moving? Yeah. Um, we would love to start early, so in the design phase, so we don't have to use all of the fancy techniques, all of the advanced techniques, because oftentimes those are not actually better than a well-designed experiment. So start thinking about what you're going to do at the end and what you want to do here. So you can use very simple analysis to answer your question and not have to deal with weird confounding factors. Um, in grad school, I was working in a stats consulting lab and I had to tell somebody that three years into their graduate project that it was confounded. It was a forestry f project and they were using different treatments on different trees, but the two plots they had picked, one was north or east facing and one was west facing. So they had two, and very well known, if you get more sun or less sun, your trees are going to grow differently. So they had confounded that very early on, growing their trees, and their three years of work dealing with these trees was completely wasted because there was no way they could use any of that data to conclude what they wanted to do. Um, so now we just, I'm going to go into sort of a fun example. This is kind of a classic example. Some of you might have seen this before. Um, but decision, this is how you make decisions with statistics. So we have some sort of test. Um, 
the truth, we don't know what the truth is, but it's either going to be false or it's going to be true. And the decisions we can make is we can go no or yes. If we say yes when it's false, it's a false positive. If we say no when it's yes, it's a false negative. And then both of these are correct outcomes. So have you seen this diagram before?
dancing. So using two pressure sensors and an Arduino in the shoe to measure forward back um, pressure at my feet and also total amount of pressure. So the lights would change um, brightness based on the total pressure on that leg and they would change color or hue on the forward back distribution. Um, it seems like a lot of the projects you're working on here are a lot more exciting than mine, though. <laughs> we were talking earlier, um, one of my favorite things about Randall is he's definitely a troll. Um, we love trolling people. Um, and so some of you have been making useless machines, but you have an idea for a useless machine. Can you talk um, about your trolling idea? I'm going to make art to put up. You've all seen anti-interactive art, art that you interact with and it then discourages you from interacting with. So, for example, um, a piece of art with do not touch signs on it and hooked up to a capacitance sensor so when somebody does touch it, a voice tells them, please do not touch the art. Or you can then progress that on from please do not touch the art to please do not lick the art and see how many people start licking the art. I guess it's probably quite a few. Oh yeah. I mean, I think it depends on where. If it's if it might have been peed on in San Francisco, probably. <laughs> I like that that's what you're thinking too, but that would be part of your experiment design, yep. right? Is if you're experimenting with your art, you gotta decide. So how this decision-making works for small things as well. Should you lick the art, yes or no? What's the probability that it's been peed on recently? What's the benefit <laughs> of licking the art? And what's the detriment that you would receive if the art has been peed on and you choose to lick it? We're that we're creating statistical models for a licking potentially peanut heart. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, Randall's also very knowledgeable about tools. I know you've played with a bunch of things, um, CNC's, we talked about some woodworking. Um, so he might hang out for a minute or two while we're sort of getting ready for lunch. Um, so if you have questions, he's definitely a great source of knowledge. <laughs>